Recording by Nolophidian. Best Russian Short Stories. Edited and compiled by Thomas Seltzer. The Cloak by Nikolai Gogol. Part 1. In the department of... But it is better not to mention the department. The touchiest things in the world are departments, regiments, courts of justice, in a word, all branches of public service. Each individual nowadays thinks all society insulted in his person. Quite recently, a complaint was received from a district chief of police, in which he plainly demonstrated that all the imperial institutions were going to the dogs, and that the Tsar's sacred name was being taken in vain, and in proof he appended to the complaint a romance, in which the district chief of police is made to appear about once in every ten pages, and sometimes in a downright drunken condition. Therefore, in order to avoid all unpleasantness, it will be better to designate the department in question as a certain department. So, in a certain department, there was a certain official. Not a very notable one, it must be allowed. Short of stature, somewhat pockmarked, red-haired and mole-eyed, with a bald forehead, wrinkled cheeks, and a complexion of the kind known as sanguine. The St. Petersburg climate was responsible for this. As for his official rank, with us Russians, the rank comes first. He was what is called a perpetual titular counselor, over which, as is well known, some writers make merry and crack their jokes, obeying the praiseworthy custom of attacking those who cannot bite back. His family name was Bashmachkin. This name is evidently derived from Bashmak, Shu. But when... At what time, and in what manner, is not known. His father and grandfather, and all the Bashmachkins, always wore boots, which were resold two or three times a year. His name was Akaki Akakievich. It may strike the reader as rather singular and far-fetched, but he may rest assured that it was by no means far-fetched, and that the circumstances were such that it would have been impossible to give him any other. This was how it came about. Akaki Akakievich was born, if my memory fails me not, in the evening on the 23rd of March. His mother, the wife of a government official, and a very fine woman, made all due arrangements for having the child baptized. She was lying on the bed opposite the door. On her right stood the godfather, Ivan Ivanovich Eroshkin, a most estimable man, who served as the head clerk of the Senate, and the godmother, Arina Semyonova Bielobrinchkova, the wife of an officer of the quarter, and a woman of rare virtues. They offered the mother her choice of three names, Mokia, Sosia, or that the child should be called after the martyr Kozdazat. No, said the good woman, all those names are poor. In order to please her, they opened the calendar at another place. Three more names appeared, Trifili, Dula, and Varakazi. This is awful, said the old woman. What names? I truly never heard the like. I might have put up with Varadat or Varuk, but not Trifili and Varakazi. They turned to another page and found Pavsikaki and Vaktisi. Now I see, said the old woman, that it is plainly fate, and since such is the case, it will be better to name him after his father. His father's name was Akaki, so let the son's name be Akaki too. In this manner he became Akaki Akakievich. They christened the child, whereat he wept, and made a grimace, as though he foresaw that he was to be a titular counselor. In this manner did it all come about. We have mentioned it in order that the reader might see for himself that it was a case of necessity, 
and that it was utterly impossible to give him any other name. When and how he entered the department, and who appointed him, no one could remember. However much the directors and chiefs of all kinds were changed, he was always to be seen in the same place, the same attitude, the same occupation. Always the letter-copying clerk, so that it was afterwards affirmed that he had been born in uniform with a bald head. No respect was shown him in the department. The porter not only did not rise from his seat when he passed, but never even glanced at him, any more than if a fly had flown through the reception room. His superiors treated him in coolly despotic fashion. Some insignificant assistant to the head clerk would thrust a paper under his nose without so much as saying, Copy, or Here's an interesting little case, or anything else agreeable, as is customary amongst well-bred officials. And he took it, looking only at the paper, and not observing who handed it to him, or whether he had the right to do so. He simply took it, and set about copying it. The young officials laughed at and made fun of him, so far as their official wit permitted, told in his presence various stories concocted about him, and about his landlady, an old woman of seventy, declared that she beat him, asked when the wedding was to be, and strewed bits of paper over his head, calling them snow. But Akaki Akakievich answered not a word, any more than if there had been no one there besides himself. It even had no effect upon his work. Amid these annoyances, he never made a single mistake in a letter. But if the joking became wholly unbearable, as when they jogged his head, and prevented his attending to his work, he would exclaim, Leave me alone! Why do you insult me? And there was something strange in the words and the voice in which they were uttered. There was in it something which moved to pity, so much so that one young man, a newcomer, who, taking pattern by the others, had permitted himself to make sport of Akaki, suddenly stopped short, as though all about him had undergone a transformation, and presented itself in a different aspect. Some unseen force repelled him from the comrades whose acquaintance he had made, on the supposition that they were decent, well-bred men. Long afterwards, in his gayest moments, there recurred to his mind the little official with the bald forehead, with his heart-rending words, Leave me alone. Why do you insult me? In these moving words, other words resounded. I am thy brother. And the young man covered his face with his hand, and many a time afterwards, in the course of his life, shuddered at seeing how much inhumanity there is in man, how much savage coarseness is concealed beneath refined, cultured, worldly refinement, and even, O oh God, in that man whom the world acknowledges as honorable and upright. It would be difficult to find another man who lives so entirely for his duties. It is not enough to say that Akaki labored with zeal. No, he labored with love. In his copying, he found a varied and agreeable employment. Enjoyment was written on his face. Some letters were even favorites with him, and when he encountered these he smiled, winked, and worked with his lips, till it seemed as though each letter might be read in his face, as his pen traced it. If his pay had been in proportion to his zeal, he would, perhaps to his great surprise, have been made even a counselor of state. But he worked, as his companions, the wits, put it, like a horse in a mill. However, it would be untrue to say that no attention was paid to him. One director, being a kindly man, and desirous of rewarding him for his long service, 
ordered him to be given something more important than mere copying. So he was ordered to make a report of an already concluded affair to another department, the duty consisting simply in changing the heading and altering a few words from the first to the third person. This caused him so much toil that he broke into a perspiration, rubbed his forehead, and finally said, No, give me rather something to copy. After that, they let him copy on forever. Outside this copying, it appeared that nothing existed for him. He gave no thought to his clothes. His uniform was not green, but a sort of rusty meal color. The collar was low, so that his neck, in spite of the fact that it was not long, seemed inordinately so as it emerged from it, like the necks of the plaster cats which peddlers carry about on their heads. And something was always sticking to his uniform, either a bit of hay or some trifle. Moreover, he had a peculiar knack as he walked along the street, of arriving beneath the window just as all sorts of rubbish was being flung out of it. Hence he always bore about on his hat scraps of melon rinds and other such articles. Never once in his life did he give heed to what was going on every day to the street, while it is well known that his young brother officials trained the range of their glances till they could see when any one's trouser straps came a-done upon the opposite sidewalk, which always brought a malicious smile to their faces. But Akaki Akakievich saw in all things the clean, even strokes of his written lines, and only when a horse thrust his nose from some unknown quarter over his shoulder and sent a whole gust of wind down his neck from his nostrils, did he observe that he was not in the middle of a line, but in the middle of the street. On reaching home, he sat down at once at the table, sipped his cabbage soup up quickly, and swallowed a bit of beef with onions, never noticing their taste, and gulping down everything with flies and anything else which the Lord happened to send at the moment. When he saw that his stomach was beginning to swell, he rose from the table and copied papers which he had brought home. If there happened to be none, he took copies for himself, for his own gratification, especially if the document was noteworthy, not on account of its style, but of its being addressed to some distinguished person. Even at the hour when the gray St. Petersburg sky had quite disappeared, and all the official world had eaten or dined, each as he could, in accordance with the salary he received and his own fancy. When all were resting from the department jar of pens, running to and fro for their own and other people's indispensable occupations, and from all the work that an uneasy man makes willingly for himself, rather than what is necessary, when officials hasten to dedicate to pleasure the time which is left to them, one bolder than the rest going to the theatre, another into the street looking under the bonnets, another wasting his evening in compliments to some pretty girl, the star of a small official circle, another, and this is the common case of all, visiting his comrades on the third or fourth floor, in two small rooms with an anteroom or kitchen, and some pretensions to fashion, such as a lamp or some other trifle which has cost many a sacrifice of dinner or pleasure trip. In a word, at the hour when all officials disperse among the contracted quarters of their friends to play whist, as they sip their tea from glasses with a kopeck's worth of sugar, smoke long pipes, relate at times some bits of gossip, which a Russian man can never, under any circumstances, refrain from, and, when there is nothing else to talk of, repeat eternal anecdotes about the commandant to whom they had sent word that the tails of the horses on the falconet monument had been cut off. When all strive to divert themselves, Akaki Akakievich indulged in no kind of diversion. 
No one could even say that he had seen him at any kind of evening party. Having written to his heart's content, he lay down to sleep, smiling at the thought of the coming day, of what God might send him to copy on the morrow. Thus flowed on the peaceful life of the man, who, with a salary of four hundred roubles, understood how to be content with his lot, and thus it would have continued to flow on, perhaps to extreme old age, were it not that there are various ills strewn along the path of life for titular counsellors, as well as for private, actual, court, and every other species of counsellor, even to those who never give any advice or take any themselves. There exists in St. Petersburg a powerful foe of all who receive a salary of 400 rubles a year, or thereabouts. This foe is no other than the northern cold, although it is said to be very healthy. At nine o'clock in the morning, at the very hour when the streets are filled with men bound for the various official departments, it begins to bestow such powerful and piercing nips on all noses impartially, that the poor officials really do not know what to do with them. At an hour when the foreheads of even those who occupy exalted positions ache with the cold, and tears start to their eyes, the poor titular councillors are sometimes quite unprotected. Their only salvation lies in traversing as quickly as possible, in their thin little cloaks, five or six streets, and then warming their feet in the porter's room, and so thawing all their talents and qualifications for official service, which had become frozen on the way. Akaki Akakievich had felt for some time that his back and shoulders were paining with peculiar poignancy, in spite of the fact that he tried to traverse the distance with all possible speed. He began finally to wonder whether the fault did not lie in his cloak. He examined it thoroughly at home, and discovered that in two places, namely on the back and shoulders, it had become thin as gauze. The cloth was worn to such a degree that he could see through it, and the lining had fallen into pieces. You must know that Akaki Akakievich's cloak served as an object of ridicule to the officials. They even refused it the noble name of cloak, and called it a cape. In fact, it was of singular make, its collar diminishing year by year to serve to patch its other parts. The patching did not exhibit great skill on the part of the tailor, and was, in fact, baggy and ugly. Seeing how the matter stood, Akaki Akakievich decided that it would be necessary to take the cloak to Petrovich, the tailor, who lived some time on the fourth floor up a dark staircase, and who, in spite of his having but one eye and pockmarks all over his face, busied himself with considerable success in repairing the trousers and coats of officials and others, that is to say, when he was sober and not nursing some other scheme in his head. It is not necessary to say much about this, Taylor, but as it is the custom to have the character of each personage in a novel clearly defined, there is no help for it. So here is Petrovich the tailor. At first he was called only Grigory, and was some gentleman's serf. He commenced calling himself Petrovich from the time when he received his free papers, and further began to drink heavily on all holidays, at first on the great ones, and then on all church festivals without discrimination, wherever cross stood in the calendar. On this point he was faithful to ancestral custom, and when quarreling with his wife, he called her a low female and a German. As we have mentioned his wife, it will be necessary to say a word or two about her. Unfortunately, little is known of her beyond the fact that Petrovich had a wife who wore a cap and a dress, but could not lay claim to beauty, at least no one but the soldiers of the guard even looked under her cap when they met her. Ascending the staircase which led to Petrovich's room, 
which staircase was all soaked with dishwater and reeked with the smell of spirits which affects the eyes and is an inevitable adjunct to all dark stairways in st petersburg houses ascending the stairs akaky akakevich pondered how much petrovich would ask and mentally resolved not to give more than two roubles the door was open for the mistress in cooking some fish had raised such a smoke in the kitchen that not even the beetles were visible akaky akakevich passed through the kitchen unperceived even by the housewife and at length reached a room where he beheld petrovich seated on a large unpainted table with his legs tucked under him like a turkish pasha his feet were bare after the fashion of tailors as they sit at work and the first thing which caught the eye was his thumb with a deformed nail thick and strong as a turtle shell about petrovich's neck hung a skin of silk and thread and upon his knees lay some old garment he had been trying unsuccessfully for three minutes to thread his needle and was enraged at the darkness and even at the thread growling in a low voice it won't go through the barbarian you pricked me you rascal akaky akakievich was vexed at arriving at the precise moment when petrovich was angry he liked to order something of petrovich when he was a little downhearted or as his wife expressed it when he had settled himself with brandy the one-eyed devil under such circumstances petrovich came down in his price very readily and even bowed and returned thanks afterwards to be sure his wife would come complaining that her husband had been drunk and so had fixed the price too low but if only a ten kopeck piece were added then the matter would be settled but now it appeared that petrovich was in a sober condition and therefore rough taciturn and inclined to demand satan only knows what price akaky akakievich felt this and would gladly have beat a retreat but he was in for it petrovich screwed up his one eye very intently at him and akaky akakievich involuntarily said how do you do petrovich i wish you a good morning sir said petrovich squinting at akaky akakievich's hands to see what sort of booty he had brought ah i to you petrovich this it must be known that akaky akakievich expressed himself chiefly by prepositions adverbs and scraps of phrases which had no meaning whatever if the matter was a very difficult one he had a habit of never completing his sentences so that frequently having begun a phrase with the words this in fact is quite he forgot to go on thinking he had already finished it what is it asked petrovich and with his one eye scanned akaky akakievich's whole uniform from the collar down to the cuffs the back the tails and the buttonholes all of which were well known to him since they were his own handiwork such is the habit of tailors it is the first thing they do on meeting one but i hear this petrovich a cloak cloth here you see everywhere in different places it is quite strong it is a little dusty and looks old but it is new only here in one place it is a little on the back and here on one of the shoulders it is a little worn yes here on this shoulder it is a little do you see that is all and a little work petrovich took the cloak spread it out to begin with on the table looked at it hard shook his head and reached out his hand to the window-sill for his snuff-box adorned with the portrait of some general though what general is unknown for the place where the face should have been had been rubbed through by the finger and a square bit of paper had been pasted over it having taken a pinch of snuff petrovich held up the cloak and inspected it against the light and again shook his head then he turned it lining upwards and shook his head once more 
after which he again lifted the general adorned lid with its bit of pasted paper, and having stuffed his nose with snuff, dosed and put away the snuff-box, and said finally, No, it is impossible to mend it. It is a wretched garment. Akaki Akakievich's heart sank at these words. Why is it impossible, Petrovich? he said, almost in the pleading voice of a child. All that ails it is that it is worn on the shoulders. You must have some pieces. Yes, patches could be found. Patches are easily found, said Petrovich. But there's nothing to sew them to. The thing is completely rotten. If you put a needle to it, see, it will give way. Let it give way, and you can put on another patch at once. But there is nothing to put the patches on to. There is no use in strengthening it. It is too far gone. It's lucky that it's cloth, for if the wind were to blow it would fly away. Well, strengthen it again. How's this, in fact? No, said Petrovich decisively. There is nothing to be done with it. It's a thoroughly bad job. You'd better, when the cold winter weather comes on, make yourself some gaiters out of it, because stockings are not warm. The Germans invented them in order to make more money. Petrovich loved on all occasions to have a fling at the Germans. But it is plain you must have a new cloak. At the word new, all grew dark before Akaki Akakievich's eyes, and everything in the room began to whirl round. The only thing he saw clearly was the general with the paper face on the lid of Petrovich's snuff-box. "'A new one?' said he, as if still in a dream. "'Why, I have no money for that.' "'Yes, a new one,' said Petrovich, with barbarous composure. "'Well, if it came to a new one, how it—' "'You mean how much would it cost?' "'Yes.' Well, you would have to lay out a hundred and fifty or more, said Petrovich, and pursed up his lips significantly. He liked to produce powerful effects, liked to stun utterly and suddenly, and then to glance sideways to see what face the stunned person would put on the matter. A hundred and fifty rubles for a cloak? shrieked poor Akaki Akakievich, perhaps for the first time in his life for his voice had always been distinguished for softness. Yes, sir, said Petrovich, for any kind of cloak. If you have a marten fur on the collar, or a silk-lined hood, it will mount up to two hundred. Uh, Petrovich, please, said Akaki Akakievich in a beseeching tone, not hearing, and not trying to hear Petrovich's words, and disregarding all his effects. Some repairs, in order that it may wear yet a little longer. No, it would only be a waste of time and money, said Petrovich. And Akake Akakevich went away, after these words, utterly discouraged. But Petrovich stood for some time after his departure, with significantly compressed lips, and without betaking himself to his work, satisfied that he would not be dropped and an artistic tailor employed. Akake Akakevich went out into the street as if in a dream. Such an affair, he said to himself. I did not think it had come to. And then, after a pause, he added, Well, so it is. See what it has come to at last. I never imagined that it was so. Then followed a long silence, after which he exclaimed, Well, so it is. See what already? Nothing unexpected that. It would be nothing. What a strange circumstance. So saying, instead of going home, he went in exactly the opposite direction without suspecting it. On the way, a chimney sweep bumped up against him and blackened his shoulder, and a hole Hatful of rubbish landed on him from the top of a house which was building. He did not notice it, and only when he ran against a watchman, 
who, having planted his halberd beside him, was shaking some snuff from his box into his horny hand, did he recover himself a little, and that because the watchman said, "'Why are you poking yourself into a man's very face? Haven't you the pavement?' This caused him to look about him and turn towards home. There only, he finally began to collect his thoughts, and to survey his position in its clear and actual light, and to argue with himself, sensibly and frankly, as with a reasonable friend, with whom one can discuss private and personal matters. No, said Akakiy Akakievich, it is impossible to reason with Petrovich now. He is that, evidently. His wife has been beating him. I had better go to him on Sunday morning. After Saturday night he will be a little cross-eyed and sleepy, for he will want to get drunk, and his wife won't give him any money. And at such a time a ten-kopeck piece in his hand will. He will become more fit to reason with. And then the cloak and that. Thus argued Akakiy Akakievich with himself regained his courage, and waited until the first Sunday, when, seeing from afar that Petrovich's wife had left the house, he went straight to him. Petrovich's eye was indeed very much askew after Saturday. His head drooped, and he was very sleepy, but for all that, as soon as he knew what it was a question of, it seemed as though Satan jogged his memory. Impossible, said he. Please to order a new one. Thereupon Akaki Akakievich handed over the ten kopeck piece. Thank you, sir. I will drink to your good health, said Petrovich. But as for the cloak, don't trouble yourself about it. It is good for nothing. I will make you a capital new one, so let us settle about it now. Akaki Akakievich was still for mending it, but Petrovich would not hear of it and said, I shall certainly have to make you a new one and you may depend upon it that I shall do my best. It may even be, as the fashion goes, that the collar can be fastened by silver hooks under a flap. Then Akakiy Akakievich saw that it was impossible to get along without a new cloak, and his spirit sank utterly. How, in fact, was it to be done? Where was the money to come from? He must have some new trousers and pay a debt of long standing to the shoemaker, for putting new tops to his old boots, and he must order three shirts from the seamstress, and a couple of pieces of linen. In short, all his money must be spent, and even if the director should be so kind as to order him to receive forty-five or even fifty rubles instead of forty, it would be a mere nothing, a mere drop in the ocean towards the funds necessary for a cloak, although he knew that Petrovich was often wrong-headed enough to blurt out some outrageous price, so that not even his own wife could not refrain from exclaiming, Have you lost your senses, you fool? At one time he would not work at any price, and now it was quite likely that he had named a higher sum than the cloak would cost. But although he knew that Petrovich would undertake to make a cloak for eighty rubles, still... Where was he to get the eighty rubles from? He might possibly manage half. Yes, half might be procured. But where was the other half to come from? But the reader must first be told where the first half came from. Akakiy Akakievich had a habit of putting, for every ruble he spent, a groschen into a small box, fastened with lock and key, and with a slit in the top for the reception of money. At the end of every half-year he counted over the heap of coppers, and changed it for silver. This he had done for a long time, and in the course of years the sum had mounted up to over forty rubles. Thus he had one half on hand. But where was he to find the other half? Where was he to get another forty rubles from? Akakiy Akakievich thought and thought, and decided that it would be necessary to curtail his ordinary expenses, for the space of one year at least, to dispense with tea in the evening, to burn no candles, and if there was anything which he must do, to go into his landlady's room and work by her light. 
When he went into the street, he must walk as lightly as he could, and as cautiously, upon the stones, almost upon tiptoe, in order not to wear his heels down in too short a time. He must give the laundress as little to wash as possible, and, in order not to wear out his clothes, he must take them off as soon as he got home, and wear only his cotton dressing gown, which had been long and carefully saved. To tell the truth, it was a little hard for him at first to accustom himself to these deprivations, but he got used to them at length, after a fashion, and all went smoothly. He even got used to being hungry in the evening, but he made up for it by treating himself, so to say, in spirit, by bearing ever in mind the idea of his future cloak. From that time forth, his existence seemed to become, in some way, fuller, as if he were married, or as if some other man lived in him, as if, in fact, he were not alone, and some pleasant friend had consented to travel along life's path with him, the friend being no other than the cloak, with thick wadding and a strong lining incapable of wearing out. He became more lively, and even his character grew firmer, like that of a man who has made up his mind and set himself a goal. From his face and gait, doubt and indecision, all hesitating and wavering disappeared of themselves. Fire gleamed in his eyes, and occasionally the boldest and most daring ideas flitted through his mind. Why not, for instance, have Martin fur on the collar? The thought of this almost made him absent-minded. Once, in copying a letter, he nearly made a mistake, so that he exclaimed almost aloud, Ugh! and crossed himself. Once, in the course of every month, he had a conference with Petrovich on the subject of the cloak, where it would be better to buy the cloth, and the color, and the price. He always returned home satisfied, though troubled, reflecting that the time would come at last, when it could all be bought, and then the cloak made. The affair progressed more briskly than he had expected, for beyond all his hopes, the director awarded neither forty nor forty-five rubles for Akaki Akakievich's share, but sixty. Whether he suspected that Akaki Akakievich needed a cloak, or whether it was merely chance, at all events twenty extra rubles were by this means provided. This circumstance hastened matters. Two or three months more of hunger, and Akaki Akakievich had accumulated about eighty rubles. His heart, generally so quiet, began to throb. On the first possible day, he went shopping in company with Petrovich. They bought some very good cloth, and at a reasonable rate, too, for they had been considering the matter for six months, and rarely let a month pass without their visiting the shops to inquire prices. Petrovich himself said that no better cloth could be had. For lining, they selected a cotton stuff, but so firm and thick that Petrovich declared it to be better than silk, and even prettier and more glossy. They did not buy the marten fur, because it was, in fact, dear, but in its stead they picked out the very best of catskin which could be found in the shop, and which might, indeed, be taken for marten at a distance. Petrovich worked at the cloak two whole weeks, for there was a great deal of quilting, otherwise it would have been finished sooner. He charged twelve rubles for the job. It could not possibly have been done for less. It was all sewed with silk in small double seams, and Petrovich went over each seam afterwards with his own teeth, stamping in various patterns. It was... It is difficult to say precisely on what day, but probably the most glorious one in Akaki Akakievich's life, when Petrovich at length brought home the cloak. He brought it in the morning, before the hour when it was necessary to start for the department. Never did a cloak arrive so exactly in the nick of time, for the severe cold had set in, and it seemed to threaten to increase. Petrovich brought the cloak himself as befits a good tailor. On his countenance was a significant expression. 
such as Akaki Akakievich had never beheld there. He seemed fully sensible that he had done no small deed, and crossed a gulf separating tailors who put in linings and execute repairs from those who make new things. He took the cloak out of the pocket handkerchief in which he had brought it. The handkerchief was fresh from the laundress, and he put it in his pocket for use. Taking out the cloak, he gazed proudly at it, held it up with both hands, and flung it skillfully over the shoulders of Akaki Akakievich. Then he pulled it and fitted it down behind with his hand, and he draped it round Akaki Akakievich without buttoning it. Akaki Akakievich, like an experienced man, wished to try the sleeves. Petrovich helped him on with them, and it turned out that the sleeves were satisfactory also. In short, the cloak appeared to be perfect and most seasonable. Petrovich did not neglect to observe that it was only because he lived in a narrow street and had no signboard, and had known Akake Akakevich so long that he had made it so cheaply, but that if he had been in business on the Nevsky Prospect, he would have charged seventy-five rubles for the making alone. Akaki Akakevich did not care to argue this point with Petrovich. He paid him, thanked him, and set out at once in his new cloak for the department. Petrovich followed him, and pausing in the street, gazed long at the cloak in the distance, after which he went to one side expressly to run through a crooked alley, and emerge again into the street beyond to gaze once more upon the cloak from another point, namely, directly in front. Meantime, Akaki Akakevich went on in holiday mood. He was conscious every second of the time that he had a new cloak on his shoulders, and several times he laughed with internal satisfaction. In fact, there were two advantages. One was its warmth, the other its beauty. He saw nothing of the road, but suddenly found himself at the department. He took off his cloak in the ante-room, looked it over carefully, and confided it to the special care of the attendant. It is impossible to say precisely how it was that everyone in the department knew at once that Akaki Akakevich had a new cloak, and that the cape no longer existed. All rushed at the same moment into the ante-room to inspect it. They congratulated him, and said pleasant things to him, so that he began at first to smile, and then to grow ashamed, when all surrounded him, and said that the new cloak must be christened, and that he must at least give them all a party, Akaki Akakevich lost his head completely, and did not know where he stood, what to answer, or how to get out of it. He stood blushing all over for several minutes, trying to assure them with great simplicity that it was not a new cloak, that it was in fact the old cape. At length one of the officials, assistant to the head clerk, in order to show that he was not at all proud, and on good terms with his inferiors, said, So be it. Only I will give the party instead of Akaki Akakievit. I invite you all to tea with me tonight. It just happens to be my name day, too. The officials, naturally at once, offered the assistant clerk their congratulations, and accepted the invitation with pleasure. Akaki Akakevich would have declined, but all declared that it was discourteous, that it was simply a sin and a shame, and that he could not possibly refuse. Besides, the notion became pleasant to him when he recollected that he should thereby have a chance of wearing his new cloak in the evening also. That whole day was truly a most triumphant festival for Akaki Akakevich. He returned home in the most happy frame of mind, took off his cloak, and hung it carefully on the wall, admiring afresh the cloth and the lining. Then he brought out his old worn-out cloak for comparison. He looked at it and laughed, so vast was the difference. And long after dinner he laughed again when the condition of the cape recurred to his mind. He dined cheerfully, and after dinner wrote nothing, but took his ease for a while on the bed until it got dark. Then he dressed himself leisurely, put on his cloak, and stepped out into the street. 
End of the Cloak by Nikolai Gogol Part 1